Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, ICAD and Mai's um, monthly update of what's happening in Israel-Palestine. And of course, this month it's dramatic, unexpectedly dramatic. Um, and we have to do our analysis because political analysis is very, is very important. You know, we're in a political struggle and we can't lose that focus. And of course, ICAD, uh, with our Palestinian partners, supports the idea of one democratic state, which today, given everything has happened over the last, uh, uh, since October 7th, might even seem absurd, I mean, ridiculous, uh, far-fetched, uh, not even relevant anymore. But that has to be our focus. As terrible as things are, or as immediately dramatic as events are, um, or you know, or are pretending or are portending to be like the Israeli invasion that is coming at any time. And of course, we have to focus on that. Nevertheless, political context is, is, is really important. And it's sometimes it's difficult, especially in the midst of a of a uh, of a conflict, you know, of what's happening, uh, things that are happening today. Um, and, uh, you know, because analysis is cold. <laughs> It's calculating, and it seems almost unfeeling um, sometimes uh, in the wake of the human tragedies that we've been experiencing uh, since October 7th. But so for, for that reason, partly, the analysis is crucial, but I want to preface this by acknowledging what is happening today. I want to acknowledge the pain and the suffering um, of the Palestinians not only beginning October 7th, of course, there's a whole history to this going back 75 years, going back 130 years when Zionism began its whole colonial project. We have to acknowledge the pain and the suffering of the Palestinians. And especially our thoughts are with the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian people, especially in Gaza, as they're experiencing the almost genocidal Israeli attacks today and something worse that is going to happen in the next day or two or three. We have to acknowledge that. And I also want to acknowledge Israeli suffering. I, we've always said, and this is key to political struggles, it's key to international law, is that, uh, is that uh, 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 civilians are not a part of the, of the military. You have to separate the military struggle the armed struggle, which is legitimate for, for depressed people, from attacks on civilians and, and, and civilian suffering. And so we have to acknowledge as well the Israeli suffering. I don't want to, this is a very important context to acknowledge and to acknowledge again what is about to happen. Having said that, let's go back then to, to the analysis part. Um, what happened was dramatic not only in terms of the breakout itself from Gaza, of course, it was dramatic in a transformational sense. It changed absolutely the, uh, the political equation here. We are never going to go back to the old uh, political discussions and the old paradigms and the old political programs of pre-October 7th. Uh, in that sense, Hamas succeeded. The Hamas operation succeeded. Uh, Question remains open, uh, did it succeed in a positive sense, given all the problematics of, of the operation we'll talk about in a minute, um, by simply shaking things up so much that it creates opportunities and openings for new initiatives and new ways of thinking and new power alignments, or in fact, has it closed down? A lot of positive developments that can happen because is shaking things up to Israel's advantage. That remains a, an open question. I think one of the points we have to begin with is that uh, this whole initiative, the operation that Hamas uh, mounted, uh, took place in a vacuum. And that's really one of the problems with it. It isn't a part of a wider resistance movement of the Palestinian people. Uh, you know, the Palestinians have been resisting all these decades. But uh, 30 years ago, with the coming of Oslo, Arafat dismantled the PLO. 
So since the early 1990s, the Palestinians have not had a national liberation organization that represents them, that hears their voices, that holds elections to a Palestinian national council, you know, that is the vehicle for national liberation. That's, that's missing and there's a vacuum. Into the vacuum, of course, came the Palestinian Authority, which is nothing more than a collaborationist regime. It has no political program. It has no leadership. 80% of the Palestinians in the occupied territories want it to just disappear. It's, an, it's become a negative force. Um, and it's, of course, it, 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 it claims to represent the Palestinian people which isn't true. And that's the, you know, so, so it, it's almost eliminated itself as a factor in, in, in liberation. So, so you have this vacuum among the Palestinians uh, and into that vacuum, Hamas comes in. Hamas has the strength, of course, it, it had the strength, it has the strength to, to, to conquer and take over. Uh, I don't want to say conquer in a coup against the Palestinian authority. Uh, to take over the governance of, of Gaza. It has military resources. Uh, it's well organized and has a clear program, not so much a political program. Hamas is a religious uh, a movement, part of the Muslim Brotherhood. And, uh, and essentially, while, it, while of course it's Palestinian and it wants to liberate Palestine, its program is to establish an Islamic state in Palestine. That is not the program of the vast majority of Palestinian people. So while many Palestinians support Hamas, if you ask them, they're supporting it from the point of view that it's the only resisting organization, uh, you know, the Palestinians have, absent a PLO, absent the Palestinian Authority, or an or absent uh, even progressive Palestinian leadership and, and, and political movement. Um, but if you would ask from my point of view, at least, the vast majority of Palestinians do not support the Hamas political program. So that, so that on the one hand, you can understand why in this vacuum people were so excited by the Hamas, Hamas initiative. On the other hand, there's a tremendous danger in this, in that Hamas, by taking this initiative, by being the only um, a resistance force, but not one that has the support of the vast majority of Palestinians um, has come to represent the Palestinians. And so, you know, it raises the stakes tremendously because what, what Hamas does, you know, has a, you know, in a sense, in a sense it does in the name of the Palestinian people or is seen as being done in the name of the Palestinian people. And that has reverberations way beyond Hamas itself. And I think it, it, it imposes a special responsibility on Hamas that I'm not sure that it's, uh, that it's accepted. Um, but what it did then was on October 7th to launch a military operation called Al-Aqsa Flood. So it's very clear that this had religious connotations to it. It wasn't merely a, a, a political liberation kind of a struggle, and it was a limited military operation. It had three goals, according to Hamas themselves. Um, the first one, again, in, in the order, the first one was to protect Al-Aqsa from perceived threats that, that Hamas has. The second one was against the crimes of apartheid. I, I'm sorry, against the crimes of occupation, you know, which is a good thing to say, but it's not very operational in terms of a military of a military operation. And the third, which I think is very important, of course, was uh, calling attention to the plight of Palestinian political prisoners. More than 5,000 political prisoners uh, that are Israel calls security prisoners in its prisons. And that is operational because in this military operation, they could have created conditions by which they could have bargained for the release uh, of those prisoners. But it was a limited, mil it was a limited uh, military operation, and it could have been, I mean, it was significant, but it could have been significant and groundbreaking in a very positive sense. Um, in other words, in other words, um, in, the, in the first hours, 
there was tremendous excitement, not only among Palestinians, but among Palestinian advocates out of the breakout. Here is, a, is an example of, of Palestinian agency. You know, a force comes out of Gaza, surprises the Israelis in a well-organized, well-planned military operation, breaks through the fence, you know, in all kinds of ways, attacks by land, by air, through gliders, by sea even, uh, attacks uh, military targets because it, it breaks through and encounters the Israeli army, of course, including tanks, uh, and then manages to break into Israel. That was that was extremely dynamic, and that was um, that was a success, and and that it by itself, I think, restored pride to the Palestinians in that they're not simply victims, but they have authority. It showed that Israel is not invincible. And in that sense, it gave it gave strength to Palestinians to continue their struggle, even though, you know, uh, they've been suffering all these years and Israel has been seen as a strong party. Uh, and uh, and it could have been great PR for the Palestinians. You know, uh, there's a struggle of narratives here. And Israel has succeeded so far in capturing the narrative that Israel is the victim and the Palestinians are perpetrators the whole language of terrorism, that could have been reversed by Hamas. They could have broken through and, uh, and, uh, and this, this sense of, uh, of the victims, the oppressors, the Palestinians rising up and beating this, this Goliath of a military power, uh, highlighting what's happening in Gaza, making Gaza a household world, word, showing what's happening to the Palestinians under occupation, that could have tremendously contributed to their soft power, which is what they need. It could have created that, that counter narrative. And it could have done other things. I think it would have made the Palestinians visible again. Again, what I do think it did was it, 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 it has um, in, ensured that there will be no political process going on, whether it's normalization or negotiations, or any political process going on that excludes the Palestinians. I think part of the idea of this breakout was to make Palestinians visible again. We are part of this equation. You can't marginalize us. You can't exclude us. You know, we're not invisible. And that's certainly what Israel has been trying to do all these years, is to marginalize the Palestinians. So they became more, more I think, more visible uh, and uh and, thir and, and finally, you know, they, they could have really had concrete success out of this military operation, um, highlighting, of course, the uh, Israeli de uh, desecration of Al-Aqsa is one thing, highlighting the crimes of occupation, again, as a part of changing that narrative into, the pal in, in, into a, a narrative, uh, you know, uh, supporting Palestinian rights. That could have been done. But most concrete was the political prisoners. Uh, Hamas could have broken through. They encountered uh, the Israeli military. They had a right to engage with the Israeli military. International law gives oppressed people the right to armed struggle. And they could have captured, as they did, they could have captured Israeli soldiers and held them as prisoners as bargaining chips for, um, for the, the political prisoners uh, of Hamas and others, all the Palestinian political prisoners in Israeli prisons. That they could have done, and that would have been great. They couldn't go out and take civilian hostages. Most of the 150 hostages that they are taking, that they, that they took and used for bargaining, is not legitimate. Even Palestinians have called for their release. You cannot capture civilians and hold them as hostages as bargaining chips. That is against international law and properly so. But nevertheless, they could have captured Israeli soldiers and kept them as bargaining chips. That would have been legitimate and legal and very effective. So in other words, the operation itself could have changed the narrative. It could have tremendously contributed to the Palestinian struggle, to strengthening the Palestinian struggle. Uh, and it could have had some real concrete uh, uh, um, um, you know, wins in terms of political prisoners. 
And then the whole thing seemed to have broken down. I can't really explain why the killings took place. And the killings, of course, have become the narrative. And they feed right into the Israeli narrative. So rather than creating a counter-narrative, a pro-Palestinian narrative, and building Palestinian soft power, that was, that was a, a, an inherent part of the military operation, the killings afterwards simply reinforced the Israeli narrative. Tony Blinken, the American Secretary of State, came to Israel today. And he says, I'm not only coming as the American Secretary of State, I'm coming as a Jew. So this whole thing is going back into that Israeli narrative, that Israeli framing that these are Jews and it's like the Holocaust and, and uh, Hamas are terrorists. And, it's, I, you know, the whole thing became counterproductive from that point of view. Not to mention the, the, co the human cost, you know, 1,200 or more civilians killed is simply unacceptable so that from a political point of view as well from a as, as from a, a human point of view why did that happen it i i don't have an explanation maybe the only thing i can think of is that hamas thought the shock effect of mass killings would somehow intimidate israel or would scare israel or would have some kind of an effect Otherwise, I can't explain it. In other words, it was a well-thought-out operation executed in an excellent way that had tremendous positive potential to it. What happened? Did Hamas really intend for those massacres to take place? That overwhelmed all, those, all, the, all the, 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 uh, the, the positive parts of the, of the military operation? Or did they simply not instruct their fighters? And simply sent them in and said, I mean, it doesn't make sense. There's a disconnect here. You know, if they had thought this out and they understood strategically the implications of this operation, why didn't they have the discipline to tell their fighters, these are our strategic goals. We want you to go out and capture as many Israeli soldiers as you can and bring them back to Gaza. You know, leave civilians alone. That, that, those should have been the strategic and political instructions given Hamas fighters, especially again, because the Hamas fighters have come to represent the Palestinians in general, not only Hamas. People don't make a differentiation, and that feeds back into the Israeli narrative that, you know, all Gazans are Hamas, and therefore there are no civilians, and now we can do the target bombing and the invasion and kill whoever we want to in, in Gaza because they're all Hamas. But in addition to that, the implication is all Palestinians are Hamas. Or you see, it's only terrorism. There is no legitimate political struggle here. It's simply uh, attacking and killing Jews. That's the Israeli narrative, and that's become dominant. If you look at the, at the international news, that is the narrative of, of the international news. So I think Hamas... Uh, you know, has done something extremely irresponsible here. Um, as Churchill once said, it, 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 uh, it took defeat out of the jaws of victory. But uh, it has really stained and, and, put, and put back by many steps, in my view, the, the legitimate, just, and noble Palestinian struggle uh, for liberation. So the question remains then... Um, where do we go from here? This, this uh, operation did transform um, the, uh, uh, you know, the situation here in Palestine, Israel. But as I sort of said in the beginning, in my kind of um, hesitating sort of way, looking for words, not in a positive way. I mean, our, we have a very clear political goal that we've developed with Palestinians that fits very much into the PLO's anti-colonial program of many years of creating one democratic state in all of Palestine that's inclusive of everyone. Uh, it's a very clear political goal. It's a just goal. It's a doable goal. But if I have to say at the beginning of these, of these remarks that today it seems absurd. In other words, if the Hamas attack has made any kind of discussion of a political settlement absurd and irrelevant and, uh, and simply 
and not part of the conversation today, then what has it done for all of us? I mean, what what is that? What has that contributed? Where we go forward, I don't know. I really don't know. I think I can. You know, we I've been talking with Linda and with Stephen and with many other members of ICAD. We have to really sit back and reevaluate where we are. We're 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 focused on the political. We're focused on the one state idea, of course. But how we go forward, and especially how we go forward with our Palestinian partners, is still open ended. I know our Palestinian partners are kind of reeling from all of this as well, um, including those of the One Democratic State campaign. So we'll see how this all unfolds. Again, the worst is coming, which is the, the invasion, the ground invasion of Gaza. So we can't really know yet how this is going to unfold and uh, and develop. So some of those discussions we'll have to wait on maybe for next month's update as well. But we're certainly in a stage of reevaluating our political uh, our political steps forward together with the Palestinians. So again, uh, our thoughts are with the Palestinians, especially the Palestinians in Gaza, uh, as this ground invasion approaches. Um, read our ICAD statement about what's happening on our ICAD website. We continue to be political actors committed to a just political resolution uh, of the situation here and more next month. Thank you. Be well.